Good afternoon, uh, good morning, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, delegates, and participants. It is my pleasure to welcome you to these high-level panel discussions on harnessing the benefits of the ocean economy for sustainable development. This discussion is taking place on the occasion of the World Ocean Day, which was celebrated around the world yesterday. Our panel is also one of the first of the high-level events to be organized on the road to UNCTAD 15, hosted by Barbados, which will take place from the 3rd to 7th of October 2021. And we're very happy to have uh, Minister Humphrey here with us. There is wide recognition of the importance of a sustainable and resilient ocean economy for achieving the 2030 Agenda, for sustainable development, as well as other international agreements such as the Samoa Pathway, the Paris Agreement, the Convention of Biological Diversity, and the Sendai Framework. The sustainable development of the ocean economy is vital to coastal developing countries and small island developing states, given their dependence on oceans for their social economic development. At the same time, these economies face important trade-related and environmental challenge, challenges, including, including marine and coastal pollution, ocean acidification, increasing natural disasters and climate change impacts, as well as constraints in terms of geography, connectivity, and capacity. This session has three main objectives. First, to discuss the main socioeconomic and environmental challenges faced by coastal countries, particularly developing countries and vulnerable seeds, in harnessing the, ben the benefits of the ocean's economy. Second, to identify priority areas for policy action, also in the context of post-pandemic recovery. And finally, to inform relevant intergovernmental processes, including UNCTAD 15, and the second UN Ocean Conference co-hosted by Portugal and Kenya that is going to take place in Lisbon in 2022. I would like to welcome our distinguished panelists. Isabel Duran, Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD, who will guide us with some opening remarks. The Honorable Kirk Humphrey, Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy of Barbados, who will, who will make, be making the keynote address. Dr. Philemon Manoni, Deputy Secretary General, Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. His Excellency Stephen Fevrier, Ambassador, OECS, Permanent Delegation to the United Nations in Geneva. His Excellency Michael Gaffey, Ambassador, Permanent Representative of Ireland to the United Nations in Geneva. Her Excellency Usha Dawak Kan Kanabadi, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Republic of Mauritius to the United Nations uh, in Geneva. This is Amy Gonzalez, Executive Director, Partnerships in Environmental Management for the Seas of East Asia. And a special thanks because it's so late in Asia now. Uh, and Mr. Anwi Benham, Honorary President of the International Oceans Institute. In preparation for this event, we approached, approached all of our distinguished panelists with some questions to help guide their interventions. We invited them to share their perspectives on some of the main challenges regarding the sustainable ocean economy, including those related to trade, pollution, climate change, connectivity, and critical coastal infrastructure, and how the regions and countries are working towards reducing their vulnerabilities and speeding up recovery in the face of COVID-19 and other setbacks. As this event provides a timely opportunity to inform the policy dialogue on the road to UNCTAD 15, we also asked our distinguished panelists to share their views on the main areas in which accelerated policy action is required to safeguard a sustainable ocean economy and going forward, what UNCTAD's priorities in this regard could and should be. As a final note, I would like to remind our audience that at the end of the interventions, we expect to have some time for Q&A. If you have a question for any of our panelists, please send it to the Q&A box, identifying, if possible, the speaker to whom it is addressed. After this introduction, let us start this event with the opening remarks of our host, Mrs. Isabel Duran, Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD. Mrs. Duran, Isabel, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, and welcome to all of you for this important event. So uh, I'm happy to start and trying to set the scene of the question. And it's true that the health and sustainable use of the oceans, many resources are critical for humanity in many ways. The ocean covers 70% of the surface of planet and it connects us. Over 80% of the volume of world trade carried by sea and it enables many economic activities that support livelihoods and allow society to prosper. As just mentioned by our today chair, sustainable and resilient ocean economy is vital for achieving the policy objectives set out in the 2030 agenda, as well as other international agreements, including Samoa Passway, Paris Agreement, Convention of Biological Diversity and the Sendai, Sendai Framework. But there are many challenges to face, including marine pollution, climate change and access and benefit sharing of marine resources. The real value of the ocean economy, while difficult to quantify, is much greater than the value of tradable oceans, goods and services, which UNCTAD estimated it's at at least uh, 2.5 trillion per year. For example, ocean assets, marine resources and marine ecosystem services have been estimated conservatively to be at least 24 trillion US dollar showing the massive contribution of oceans to sustain life and economic activities. However, even this figure does not consider the overall value of coastal and marine resources as a whole, including in terms of global value chains, socioeconomic benefits and important indirect benefits, such as those provided by from erosion. It's island nations are especially dependent on seaports, including for food and energy, as well as in the context of disaster risk management and response. And I'm sure that, of course, Minister Humphrey will speak about that as uh, totally involved in those questions. Therefore, ensuring the sustainability of maritime transport and the climate resilience of ports and other critical assets on which ocean economy activities depend is key to harnessing the benefits of the ocean economy for sustainable development. Maritime transport should not remain outside the ambition of the Paris Agreement. The ocean economy and notably shipping also has an important role to play when it comes to mitigating climate change. UNCTAD fully supports international endeavors that aim at decarbonizing shipping. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the global economy in an unprecedented way. It has sensitized the world to our share fragility and the importance of preserving and managing wildlife, biodiversity and ecosystems in a sustainable way. It has also served as a reminder of the importance of well-functioning global supply chains that rely heavily uh, on maritime transportation networks and the important economic knock-on effects which result from disruptions and delays. The ocean economy experienced a similar downward trend as global trade, albeit uneven. For example, due to measures taken to address the pandemic, trade in goods dropped by about 6%, while trade in services fell by 16% in 2020. In contrast, trade in certain oceans-based goods, such as tuna and tuna products exports, have shown a certain level of resilience, while coastal and marine tourism has dropped about 70%, with subsectors such as cruise tourism coming completely to a halt. Global port calls uh, declined by 10% in 2020, while maritime trade flows contracted. But it is not the end of the story, of course. Recovery appears to be on track. In the first quarter of 2021, the value of global trade in goods and services grew by about 4% quarter over quarter 
and by about 10% year over year. A, rec a recovery is also underway across the maritime transport sector, albeit still fraught with uncertainty and progressing at different speeds across region and shipping market segments. Containerized trade has been showing more resilience as it is closely linked to production and consumption patterns and to developments in consumer habits, including online shopping and e-commerce. Today's event focuses on how countries can harness the ocean's economy as an integral part of sustainable development. We will also discuss the role that UNCTAD can play to address the socioeconomic and environmental challenges that coastal developing countries face and how to enable blue COVID-19 recovery strategies. Key issues for consideration have been highlighted on the UNCTAD meetings page for today's event and to start the discussion. They include challenges and opportunities related to sustainable trade in ocean-based goods and services, fisheries and aquaculture, sustainable maritime transport, connectivity and climate resilient ports, sustainable tourism and sustainable offshore energy. This event provides a unique opportunity to focus on some of these issues, help identify priority areas where accelerated policy action is needed and guide UNCTAD's work to ensure we make an important contribution going forward. In closing, we hope today's discussion will inform the preparatory process of the UNCTAD 15 conference to be hosted by our friends and partners Barbados and the second UN Ocean Conference in 2021 convened by Portugal and Kenya. On this note, even if I'm not the captain, I invite all panelists and stakeholders to come on board to provide you valuable insights and to engage and participate actively. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Duran, uh, co-captain. <laughs> uh, I now uh, have the honor to give the floor to the Honorable uh, Kirk Humphrey, Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy of Barbados, who will provide a keynote address. Minister Humphrey is the first to hold this post in Barbados. He was appointed in May 2018 as part of the new administration. The focus of the ministry is to streamline and coordinate Barbados' blue economy and to explore new industries and revenue streams from the ocean while conserving and preserving the marine environment in most sustainable ways. Minister Humphrey will talk about the experience of his country in creating a ministry of maritime affairs and the blue economy, about the importance of a sustainable ocean economy and key message from the perspective of Barbados, the host of the UNCTAD 15 conference. Minister Humphrey, the floor is, is yours. Thank you so very much, Excellencies. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to all. I greet you on behalf of the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados and the people of Barbados as we build the momentum on the road to UNCTAD 15, hosted by Barbados, under the theme from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. I start with what I hope will give a little bit of Barbadian inspiration to those of us who occupy this space and are therefore charged with attending to the affairs of the ocean. I'm also inclined to make a confession on this Caribbean morning, a behavior that many may find strange for a person involved in politics. But for the work that lays ahead of us, I strongly believe that honesty is the best policy. The inspiration I wish to share comes from one of my country's literary icons, Frank Collimore, in a piece aptly entitled, Him to the Sea, and he wrote, like all who live on small islands, I must always be remembering the sea, being always cognizant of her presence viewing her through apertures in the foliage, hearing when the wind is from the south, her music and smelling, the warm rankness of her tasting and feeling her kisses on bright sunbathed days, I must always be remembering the sea. As for the confession, well, I have dreamt of being a poet, I admit, so that perhaps I too could capture the ocean, the giver of life in a way similar to Frank Collimore. But were I a poet of any note, 
what story would I tell you now? What overriding emotion would fuel my words? What imagery would I be able to craft and give to you? Could I command you with my words to search your soul to determine if we are doing our best and if we are being our best? For a Caribbean man in search of a muse, there is no better inspiration than the sea. For the story of the Caribbean for both good and bad is a story of the power of the sea. Our original settlers, the Amerindians, arrived after rowing their way up South America's Orinoco River, which empties out into the Caribbean Sea. Then came Europeans crossing the Atlantic and creating colonies across the Western Hemisphere. Colonization paved the way for the arrival by the ocean of Africans against their will, who endured some of the worst conditions in the history of mankind followed by indentured Indians, Indians and Chinese. These harsh conditions continued well into the 20th century and compelled hundreds of thousands to immigrate, to migrate, this time via steam power ships to Panama, to Brazil, North America, and to Europe. And even now, when the sky has now taken over from the seas as the main method to move our people across the globe, being on a small island, means that the sea still brings us our food, our energy, the things we trade, and much, much more. It is, this ocean, it is the ocean's balance, however, that most appeals to me. Even in the midst of hardship, my ancestors paid homage to the ocean that gave food and water and respite. It gave life to the people who went before me. And history is told of the many songs sung by the ocean when a struggling Caribbean people remembered a good life gone or dreamt of a better day to come. Like all who live on small islands, I too must always be remembering the sea. I begin this way only to convey a sense of what the ocean means to me, not as a minister of government, but as a man whose life force is tied directly to the sea. I begin this way to remind you of the greatest truth that there is no more symbolic yet real and tangible connector between all nations and all people on this planet than the ocean. We can debate religion, though we probably should not. Arts and culture, all kinds of human achievement, but there should be no debating the importance of safeguarding our oceans. For it is the ocean that makes us viable as a species and it is the eternal thread that binds us. Our ancestors paid homage to the ocean in the worst of times. And so we, we must, in these times of trouble, also pay homage to the ocean. So let me share my thoughts very quickly around four questions. One, why is a sustainable ocean economy important for SIDS and coastal developing countries? In answering this, my mind goes to the thoughts above that I just shared, but I will share with you a few more reasons. Our ocean space in Barbados is 424 times the size of our land space. There is much opportunity there and more in our areas beyond national jurisdiction, a lot of which we really do not fully understand or know about. Two, a sustainable ocean economy has the potential to transform the lives of communities via development of non-extractive industries that provide higher value added opportunities. The studies that we've done here in Barbados have shown us the value, for example, of keeping a turtle alive or a fish alive and that that brings back so much value to people. And that is why the idea of protecting 30% of the ocean resonates so strongly with me and with this country. In so doing, however, we have to ensure the benefits outweigh the opportunity costs or that we can offer some form of compensation or alternative livelihood to the people who may suffer losses while we protect that space. And in a real way, I'm talking about the fishermen, and the people who go to the sea daily, the jet ski operators and so on, who spend their lives on the sea. We have also to constantly communicate with our partners. We have to make a strong case that the existence values or the bequest values are more important than the extractive values. And this is going to be a difficult conversation for some. The ocean is valuable in itself is the point that we must make. Safeguarding it for future generations is valuable in itself. And that even in cases where we must extract then, there is still 70% of the ocean left. And even then, I do hope we do it in a, in a sustainable way. There's also the argument for ecological economics. 
In these times, it is critical to acknowledge and preserve the assets upon which the income flow depends. It simply makes sense. And for tourism-based economies, a lot, almost all, depends on the ocean. This point is also tied to the point above that I'm about to make. Our economic well-being is dependent on the ocean. If the assets of the ocean are destroyed, there will be significant welfare losses, especially for the most vulnerable. And, and, and you know, in, in Barbados and in small societies, we know our people by name. The people who ply their trade on the sea, we know them by name. The people who live along the coast, we know them by name. This is a real tragedy for those of us who operate in this space. So many of us who are dealing with the SDGs, we want to make sure that we achieve what the SDGs set out to achieve. So many SDGs address what is written in the idea of a sustainable blue economy. SDG number one, to reduce poverty or no poverty. Two, zero hunger. Three, clean water and sanitation. Seven, affordable and clean energy. Eight, looking at economic growth and climate action and so on in 14. And life beneath water in 14, sorry. If we are serious about the SDGs, we must be serious about the ocean. We are certain recipients of the ocean's discontent in the Caribbean, though we were innocent in its offense. And I want to repeat that. We are certain recipients in the Caribbean of the island's discontent, though we are, have done nothing to cause the offense. Caribbean nations are grappling with rising sea levels, declining fish caches, dying corals, and more. We are facing more violent and virulent hurricanes every year. Sargasm seaweed is covering our beaches and affects us in everything we do. And if you've not seen sargasm seaweed, this is a thing that covers the entire beach, running our tourism to nothing, preventing people from being able to make a living. Developed nations of the world must open their eyes to what we are facing open their understanding and recognize that we are not responsible for the wolf at our door. Open their heavily loaded arsenal to the various tools that we need to get through this difficult moment. And finally, open their clenched fists to hold the hand of developing nations of the world who must stand on shaky ground or swim in murky waters. It is for these reasons and more that we need a sustainable ocean economy. And that is why it is so important for SIDS. The second question, what has been the experience of Barbados in creating a Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy? Well, we started this even before COVID-19, and we were dealing with a lot of things to transform this country and to make us ready for a new world. Led by Prime Minister Mia Motley, a lot of our major focus in this island was to address issues pertaining to global warning, warming, mega hurricanes, and so on. This is a large part of why our government created the region's first Blue Economy Ministry, which I have the honor to lead. Our efforts must be to protect our blue economy space at all costs. The idea that we must, the idea that we must preserve our ocean space find, and find sustainable ways to ensure production in this space and make sure everything redounds to the benefit of people is what we are inclined and forced now to do. So I speak to you of three Ps and I pause here for a second. You must preserve. We must produce for people. And these three P's should define all that small island developing nations do. Whether we see ourselves as big ocean developing states who cater to big ocean people, preserve and produce for people. As I said before, our geographical position locates us in the immediate vicinity of the most devastating results of the global climate change crisis. However, while the ocean brings danger, it also brings opportunity if we seek to understand it. That is why we are working with our partners to get a better understanding of the science and in being strategic in our plans. So let me thank the UNDP very quickly. I wanna thank them for their work on the Blue Spoken Study with Barbados, the IDB on the Strategic Roadmap and the National Coastal Risk Information Platform. I wanna thank the FAO, they're doing so many things with us and the International Maritime Organization who is also working with us. And I must tell you, cabinet recently approved a paper that would allow us to integrate the MARPOL and its sits in our legislation, thereby reducing air pollution by ships. And we all must do this. I wanna thank also the Nature Conservancy for agreeing to help with the Marine Spatial Plan for Barbados. And most recently, most recently as in yesterday, 
I want to thank the Commonwealth Secretariat and the Republic of Seychelles for allowing us to co-lead the Commonwealth through Charter Action Group on Marine Protected Areas. The idea of preservation is essential to us from, and all that we are doing. At the same time, the Caribbean region's largest resource base is the coastal and marine assets, which the World Bank report is at about $400 billion. I give this duality to you so that you can fully appreciate what we have set out to do. That our targets are ambitious, but unambiguous. We plan to establish our island as a global hub for climate resilience and ocean innovation. Our vision is to sustainably leverage the ocean, and I suspect this is the challenge for all people to sustainably leverage the ocean as a natural resource and provide the required supportive policy development and physical infrastructure to stimulate economic growth and better protect oceans and coastal states and marine life. Barbados is ready to be a campus and a hub for the world's leading funds, researchers, scientists, designers, technologists, media entities, entrepreneurs, and so on focus on the ocean. We are ready to position the island as a global platform for sustainable projects, policies, innovations, and solutions that need to be scaled up and offered digitally to the globe. Barbados is open for business, and we are excited about exploring partnerships with like-minded governments, multilateral organizations, NGOs, and so on, even as we offer some policy that could contribute meaningfully to the lives of other people. Three, and very quickly, how can the sustainable development of the ocean economy be strengthened as part of post-COVID-19 recovery and development? A lot of people are talking about this. It's been spoken of this morning. But it is clear to me, for those of us in the Caribbean, that a monoculture does not work. Whether it be sugar, manufacturing, or tourism, this approach has failed the region. And we need development on various planks. In this vein, we must build out our ocean economy as a fundamental plank of economic diversification. For example, two days ago, we welcomed back cruise ships to the region. The first cruise ship in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere for over 15 months came to Barbados, and I want to thank them. But now we must see this opportunity differently and look at the ocean as a platform for a new wave of jobs and business opportunities, ocean food, ocean logistics, and transportation. My point is that we cannot do what we have done. We must build back differently. And while we bounce back, we also have to bounce forward. But economies of scale dictate that we will not compete en masse, but we must compete in efficiency, flexibility, and innovation. And this is the challenge I offer to all small island developing states. So here are a few thoughts, most of which I do not have time this morning to explore, but many of which are repeated in many places. All small island developing states or big ocean developing states need the correct policy environment and the correct infrastructure that will ensure a sustainable blue economy. This comes at a cost and we must therefore prioritize the blue economy investment. Two, we must improve the business environment and make it easier to do business in Barbados. That is why Barbados is working assiduously to improve its trade across borders. Three, we must strengthen our institutions. The importance of this evidence-based evidence policy cannot be understated. Four, as we move forward in Barbados, we must look at new ways of doing things as we continue across the region to enhance the regulatory environment and the capacity to develop and implement viable projects. This includes a recognition that the role of that the, this includes a recognition of the role of developing countries and private sector and civil society must all play a part. I will just list these points. Four, we must focus on resources. And five, as we move on with a little bit of haste, physical, capa physical capital development and so on is also going to be very important. We need inclusivity. And the blue economy concepts also posits inclusiveness as one of its core ideals. But there are often challenges associated with efforts to formulate certain informal structures. Examples, small scale fisheries, and spread the benefits of growth across different socioeconomic groups. Additionally, the introduction of larger private sector firms into some predominantly informal sectors such as fishing and marine tourism may lead to a crowding out of vulnerable populations who engage in these activities. As such, the strategy needs to identify disadvantaged groups and seek to promote a more inclusive approach to development. Six, 
We also need regional integration and an integrated and comprehensive policy accepted and promoted regionally, which supports the development of a blue economy strategy. And this is going to be necessary for our success. My final question that I ask and ask here is what will be the key messages of Barbados as the host of UNCAD 15 Conference on Sustainable Ocean Economy? I think the conference theme exposes the underlying message that we must convey to the world, that to move from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all, that everyone must be involved and play their part. It also hints at a call to action for all of us to do better for countries in need of assistance. At every stage, it is stated, and I quote, that the 15th session of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development presents an opportunity for the development community to align the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development with the global new normal created by the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it will be essential that we speak directly to the compounding of many issues that were facing developing countries that have only been deepened by the pandemic. There were structural issues before. As stated, UNCTAD 15 promises to address unmet, the massive unmet trade, financial investment, and technology needs of developing countries struggling in the face of the COVID-19 challenges. As host, Barbados will continue with the fearless and visionary leadership led by Prime Minister Mia Motley that has on several occasions sought to lay bare the idea that SIDS are invisible and dispensable. But we do know with a sense of hope and with a sense of pride and a strong faith that the pandemic has left us with an understanding that we need each other now more than ever. That is our hope coming out of the conference. Recognizing that we are connected at the core, much like the way the ocean connects us. This pandemic reminds us that to leave one person behind is to put at risk all the gains we have made in the last century. I hope that we have learned that we can even reap more gains if we adopt an approach that seeks to maximize and explore the individual and collective resources of small islands everywhere. If I were indeed a poet, as I began, I would wish to capture this moment in a verse equal to the many that have immortalized the names of heroes and heroines everywhere. I would hope to capture this moment by saying that the world stood up and conclude that they stood up not only for small nations, but for all nations. So like Frank Collimore Hall, like all who live, all who live everywhere in different parts of the world, all who do different things as it relates to the ocean and to the sea. Those of us who are on this Zoom, who came here today to have a conversation, we too must always be remembering the sea. I thank you for listening to me. I wanna thank you and wish you good luck with all your deliberations. And I trust this will be a very fruitful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, I think those were very inspiring words and we're really much looking forward to the conference that you're hosting uh, uh, late in the year. Thank you very much. Um, I, I now, um, uh, now let's, uh, let us move now to hear from the perspective of small islands and developing states from the Pacific. We have an intervention by video message from Dr. Philemon Manoni, Deputy Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, and look forward to learning from his insights. Uh, I think we, we are now going to see a video. Ms. Isabel Durant, Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD, uh, the Honorable Kirk uh, Humphrey, Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy of Barbados, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to join you today in this high level panel discussion on the important topic of harnessing the benefits of the ocean economy for sustainable development. The Pacific Ocean has been the bedrock of many of the regional instruments the region had developed in the past decades. Most recently, 
forum leaders issued their ocean statement 2021 in March this year. Through this statement, Pacific leaders reaffirmed their commitment to sustainable manage, use and conserve our ocean and its resources as one blue Pacific, guided by our re regional commitments and policy instruments. <coughs> These policy instruments include the 2002 Pacific Islands Regional Ocean Policy, the 2010 Framework for the Pacific Ocean Scape, and the 2016 Pompeii Ocean Statement. Furthermore, when weaved into the leader's vision for Pacific regionalism, the ocean economy has been defined as the Blue Pacific narrative of a single, united, ocean-based blue continent. The Blue Pacific narrative recognizes the inseparable links between the oceans, seas, and the Pacific Island people, and the ocean is the basis of livelihoods for the peoples. It seeks to achieve sustainable development that combines economic, social, and cultural development in ways that improve livelihoods and well being of the people of the Pacific and the use of the environment in a sustainable way. The region is now developing a 2050 strategy for this Blue Pacific continent. And indeed, oceans will be a key underpinning and cross cutting strategic focus area. In framing my comments today, I will focus on fisheries and sustainable ocean economy, how COVID-19 has impacted our ocean economy and the opportunities for the future. Fisheries is a long-standing priority area for regional cooperation amongst foreign members. Fisheries products are an important export item for many of the countries in the Pacific, accounting for over half of all exports from the region. In some countries, the export values of fishery product make up to 80% of the total export values. The most important is of course, the tuna fishery and the health of this resource is of paramount importance in our region. With the collaboration between regional fisheries organizations and agencies, such as the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, the Pacific Community, uh, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, and of course the parties to the Nauru Agreement, our region has been successful in maintaining the good health of our commercial tuna stocks. In effect, 55% of global tuna catch in 2019 was taken from the Western Central Pacific region. In 2016, the Pacific Island Forum leaders had called for an end to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. And in 2018, had further called on distant water fishing nations to eliminate subsidies to overcapacity and overfishing. In this regard, and of great importance is a WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies that targets the large industrial fleets that account for over 80% of global fisheries subsidies. The agreement is important as it also ensures that the interests of developing countries, including Pacific seeds, are taken into account in line with SDG 14.6, the mandate on special and differential treatment. In addition, this agreement must provide policy space for the Pacific Islands and SEEDS to develop their fishing capacity to enable them to directly exploit their fisheries resources in the future. ANCTAD's role is therefore important. It would be important in assisting developing countries, especially the SEEDS and the least developed countries with the implementation of the fisheries subsidies agreement. 
Our climate resilient ports, PIFS is currently working with ANTA on port management project to facilitate trade at the border by improving port efficiency in the Pacific. One aspect that may need to be incorporated is the sustainability dimension of port operations and management. The public health measures and border closures in response to COVID-19 has impacted trade and other major economic activities in the Pacific region, including ocean-based economic activities, such as tourism and fisheries. In this context, to respond and to recover, fisheries has been identified as one of the focus areas in recognizing that maintaining market access and accessing new markets for the region's fisheries products is an important priority. The export of fresh tuna and other fresh fisheries products, especially those that predominantly rely on air freight for transportation, were no doubt hard hit due to the increased air freight costs. The Secretariat continues to work to mobilize support to address the high air freight costs in our region. Furthermore, a Pacific Aid for Strategy 2020 to 2025 was endorsed by the Foreign Trade Ministers in 2020. It has a critical role to play in helping developing countries turn trade policies and strategies into real world trade development. We will welcome support from ANCTA in implementing this strategy, which focuses on services sector, the e-commerce, comprehensive connectivity, and deepening foreign market. To consolidate our regional efforts towards sustainable use of our ocean resources, the Secretariat is seeking a mandate from our economic ministers this year to develop a Blue Pacific economic strategy. This strategy aims to assist our members stabilize their economies against the impacts of COVID-19 and to build resilience to future shocks and support their long-term recovery efforts. Recognizing the importance of our ocean resources, a key feature of this strategy will be on the sustainable ocean economy with a focus on the blue economy as a driver of ocean-based economic activities in an integrated and sustainable manner to generate innovative ocean finance opportunities. The revenues generated by tuna are predominantly from excess fees today. However, we want to reduce our dependency on this source of revenue and to diversify our revenue streams and to increase opportunities, including nature-based solutions and more innovative financing mechanisms. The Blue Pacific Economic Strategy will also explore opportunities in aquaculture and sustainable and reliable value chains, an essential area for trade and development of fisheries and aquaculture products. The development of this strategy will require expertise in trade, finance, and ocean, and we welcome the opportunity to partner with ANTAD in the development of this important strategy and to support our economies. We will look to utilize the existing memorandum of understanding between our two organizations as a starting point for our collaboration. We look forward to further discussions on this point. To conclude, we join the Pacific Oceans Commissioner in a call for greater collaboration with development partners to improve economic recovery efforts and the formation of a sustainable ocean economy in response to the pandemic challenges. At ANCTAD 15, we should ensure that ANCTAD's mandate on oceans economy is continued and reflected in the outcomes. This would enable ANCTAD to assist SIDS like us in the Pacific with technical assistance and capacity building. Finally, ANCTAD 15 and Oceans Conference 
should focus more on mobilizing the required resource to support the work on sustainable oceans economy, and particularly in the small islands developing states. I thank you again and wish you all a fruitful, fruitful deliberation today. We look forward to the outcomes of these deliberations. Thank you. We thank Dr. Manoni and the Pacific Islands Foreign Secretariat for their very valuable insights. Um, now we look forward to hearing from His Excellency Ambassador Février from the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states on some of the opportunities offered by oceans-based goods and services and blue bio trade to contribute to building a sound and sustainable ocean economy. Ambassador Février will also discuss some of the main challenges faced by his region, including those arising from climate change impacts on ports and other critical coast, coastal transport infrastructure. And on addressing these going forward, Ambassador, uh, uh, Ambassador Février, the floor is, is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, acknowledge uh, Honorable Cook, uh, E.M. Humphrey, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Minister of Maritime Affairs at the Blue Economy, uh, Madam Isabel Dumas, Secretary General of UNCTAD, uh, fellow members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to share some thoughts and perspectives with you today on our collective relationship and responsibility to the ocean. Permit me also at the outset to thank Minister Humphrey for what was a tour de force on the reasons why we must preserve our oceans. Let me also thank him for a strong call for intergenerational, intergenerational equity and for reminding us of the intrinsic value of the oceans. This year's theme for World Ocean Day the ocean, life and livelihoods is particularly timely for small island developing states. Today's commemoration, like most other international observances, will take place largely through virtual means as a consequence of the pandemic. It is worth further acknowledging that the pandemic has had a most profound impact on our collective relationship with the ocean. This is fundamentally the case for small island developing states. According to the United Nations Development Program, uh, the dramatic global economic slowdown caused by COVID-19 had a significant impact not only on jobs, economies, and governments, but also on the terrestrial and marine ecosystems. In the short run, the impacts of the pandemic on the health of the ocean have largely been positive due to the reduction in various sectoral pressures that lead to pollution, overfishing, habitat loss, invasive species introductions, and the impact of climate change on our oceans. While the ocean may enjoy some near-term respite and benefits, the livelihoods and food security of tens or even hundreds of millions of people have been seriously impacted. Indeed, in much of the Caribbean, in the early phase of the crisis, those coastal communities that relied heavily on the sea for income and livelihoods were severely impacted. Indeed, during the shutdowns, significant slowdowns were registered in major economic sectors of fishing, shipping, coastal and cruise tourism, as well as yachting and the other ancillary services that support these vital sectors. In an informal poll conducted by The Economist magazine recently, participants ranked the following ocean sectors as impacted most by COVID-19. Tourism, 70.7%, fisheries, 10.4%, offshore oil and gas, 7.2%, shipping, 6.2%, offshore renewables 2.9% and aquaculture 2.6%.
It is evident uh, from recent uh, trade and economic data uh, for this year, the recovery of uh, those sectors and forward guidance from corporates paint a picture of strong recovery, a recovery that at once will reverse some of the ecological gains made through lower emissions and underutilization of fragile marine ecosystems, but equally, the return of jobs and livelihoods to those affected would be welcome. This brings us back to the theme of this year's observance, the ocean, life and livelihoods, or with some artistic license from you, perhaps this could be rephrased to the theme of how can the two life and livelihoods effectively and meaningfully coexist Allow me to offer two reflections on how we can con contribute to this objective. As you would doubtlessly know, the WTO membership is working on binding disciplines to restrain the worst impulses of WTO member states related to the $40 billion in subsidies provided to the fishery sector. These subsidies have incentivized and variously made commercially viable certain fishing and fisheries practices that undermine global stocks. The proposed agreement will seek to limit the ability of national authorities to provide subsidies that contribute to overfishing and overcapacity and prohibit those that support IEU fishing. In the spirit of this year's theme of life and livelihoods, OECS member states continue to press for an agreement that would target those members and operators that have the most damaging and pernicious impact on stocks and the underlying ecosystems. Let me be equally clear. We do not believe that the support programs in small island developing states that have no systemic impacts on stocks should be targeted. So while the temporary respite from unsustainable economic activity in the marine sector brought about by the pandemic is likely to come to an end, there are steps we can take together to restrain the worst and most dangerous commercial impulses. These include a strong outcome in the context of the WTO negotiation on fishery subsidies. Permit me a second reflection that I would like to share. In closing, and that reflection relates to the future of our economic relationship with the seas and oceans. More concretely, how can our development and investment thesis evolve to keep pace with our desire to sustainably coexist with the ocean? In other words, how can we sustainably harness the economic potential of our vast oceans resources while at once secure the future and sustainability of those oceans. Sustainable finance here refers to any form of financial service integrating environmental social governance criteria into business and investment decisions. Consumers and financial markets may already be ahead of us policymakers in this regard. Efforts at ensuring that corporates respond to environmental and social governance issues have become a central and catalyzing force in public markets and in the choices that consumers make. Take, for example, sustainability labels and marks of good housekeeping related to fisheries and other marine activities is a key driver of consumer demand. More broadly, sustainable finance, including sustainable funds, green bonds, impact investment, microfinance, green trade finance, and sustainability link guarantees can be of assistance. Hence, the entire financial system is slowly moving in the direction of sustainability. For example, at the start of 2018, global sustainable investment assets reached $31 trillion, a 34% increase over the figure for 2016. This figure has, of course, increased through the pandemic. While the total pool of investment is not disaggregated to account for oceans-based sustainability investment, it is clear that the trend in all sectors is tracking towards sustainability. 
What does this mean for us as policymakers? The OECS has started to now mainstream sustainability into its programmatic sector development group, including in the oceans. In this view, the OECS, along with our partners at Umtan and CITES, are implementing a blue biotrade project. This project will seek to sustainably harvest marine sectors based on sustainability link criteria. So in closing, going forward, it is important to take positive steps to conclude the WTO fishery subsidies negotiations and also ensure that development of our marine sectors are incentivized by sustainable finance and develop based on effective sustainability criteria. Pongtad 15 is a good target to renew our commitment. I therefore take this opportunity to recognize the leadership of the government of Barbados in this endeavor. Let me close by borrowing the words just spoken by Minister Humphreys. We need to preserve, produce for our people. Thank you. Many thanks, Ambassador uh, Fevrier, for your in insightful remarks. It was very, very um, interesting also to uh, see you put together expertise in different organizations. Uh, I think that's very helpful. Um, uh, let me now give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Michael Gaffey from Ireland, an island nation in the global north. Um, Ambassador Gaffey will share his perspectives on the topic of today's discussions, including in the light of some of the major environmental challenges to sustainable maritime transport and port infrastructure, and on how to make progress in addressing this effectively. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rui. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, greetings and thanks to all the distinguished uh, participants uh, and uh, panelists. Um, I just all, I just have amended my, uh, my my speech slightly because I was inspired by uh, Minister Humphrey's brilliant um, speech uh, to and, and his poetry to open with some Irish poetry. And I would just open with the uh, poem by our great poet Seamus Heaney. Um, and it's called Lovers on Arran, and Arran is an island on the Atlantic West coast of Ireland. And it just says something about the relationship between land and sea. So I'll just share this with you briefly. The Lovers on Arran. The timeless waves, bright, sifting, broken glass came dazzling around into the rocks, came glinting, sifting from the Americas to possess Arran. Or did Arran rush to throw wide arms of rock around a tide that yielded with an ebb with a soft crash. Did sea define the land or land the sea? Each drew new meaning from the wave's collision. Sea broke on land to full identity. So really what we're saying, what we're hearing there is that for an island nation, and especially for a small island nation, the relationship between land and sea is a question not just of economy, but essentially of identity. Uh, and that, I think, is very appropriate for our discussion today. And now I become much more prosaic as I move on to my own, on to my own words. But um, to, to be honest, UNCTAD 15, which we are preparing for, it provides a vital opportunity for transformative policy making and action for the sustainable development of our planet. And the COVID pandemic has highlighted the tension between the need for global action to address global problems and the almost instinctive initial impulse of many states and policymakers to focus on the national and the domestic in the heat of perceived existential crisis. As the pandemic continues, revealing and accentuating inequalities at every level, but with the prospects that vaccines can lift us all out of it, we would do well to review how the world responded and the implications for progress on the SDGs. The themes of the goals remain valid, but the nature of our response to the pandemic will hold lessons for us all on the prospects for their achievement. This panel discussion therefore comes at a pivotal moment, and it is no coincidence that UNCTAD 15 will be hosted by Barbados, a small island developing state. The SIDS face the most obvious, although not always sufficiently recognized, existential threat as a result of climate change and rising sea levels. But it is important that we recognize that SID's interests are not merely sectoral interests. Climate change and ocean issues are of global impact, not least in terms of international trading patterns and transport links. 
And the development of the ocean economy, as everyone is emphasizing today, is central to sustainable development and the 2030 agenda. Our oceans hold 97% of all our water and 80% of our life forms. They provide enough oxygen for every second breath we take and absorb 50 times more carbon dioxide than our atmosphere. Without healthy oceans, life itself on the planet is at risk. The ocean's vast resources are critical to the health and existence of sustainable human societies. Now, we know the statistics on the importance of oceans for trade, but it's just worth noting that if it were a national economy, the global blue economy would be the seventh largest in the world, and the ocean as an economic entity would be large enough to take part in the G7 meetings this week. The effects of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions on our oceans are already dramatic, and there is already an agenda for action. In terms of mitigation, there is huge ocean-related renewable energy potential through offshore wind. On the adaptation side, a number of actions have been identified to protect vulnerable coastal populations from sea level rise and extreme weather events. And for the fisheries sector, there is the need to reduce over-exploitation. Tourism must be made more sustainable and benefit local communities. The threats posed by maritime pollution, including litter and plastic and other types of waste, must also be addressed. In all of these responses, we need international agreement and commitment to responses, but we also need to recognize the central importance of the interests and views of communities directly affected and threatened. Ireland is a small island nation with an economy dependent on external trade and trading links. Our seas play a vital role in terms of our health and well-being, climate, economy, and society. And it actually took us many years of development to recognize this. We were taught in school that Ireland, Ireland was an island without natural resources. And yet our population was decimated by famine in the second half of the 19th century because of the failure of a single crop, the potato crop. Yet if you were to take our seabed area into account, Ireland is one of the largest EU states with sovereign or exclusive rights over one of the largest sea to land ratios of any EU state. This is a vast natural resource. And the Irish public is very clear in its belief that more action is needed to improve the health of our oceans. In 2020, Ireland's first ocean citizen survey was carried out. 92% of respondents strongly agree that more action is needed to improve the health of the ocean. 85% strongly agree that human action are damaging the ocean. 67% strongly agree that economic growth and job generation can be supported by the ocean seas and inland waters. So Ireland uh, has set its ambition to achieve net zero emissions no later than 2050 and a 51% reduction in emissions by the end of this decade. This will require a huge effort and we set a domestic goal of 70% renewable electricity by 2030 that will require development of significant offshore renewable energy generation capacity. Now, the success of this national action is totally dependent on a more effective international approach. Rising sea levels, ever more severe storm surges, saltwater intrusion, and the coastal destruction of recent decades have already taken a massive toll, especially on small islands. And whether it is the impact on water supplies, agriculture, or fisheries, already these nations have very specific needs, and there is an obligation on the international community to engage actively in the work of building resilience for a challenging future. We in Ireland are implementing our first SID strategy, recognizing our solidarity and commonality of interests with other small islands. And I won't go into the details of that at the moment, but it is a significant moment of solidarity for us. Um, but it should be stating the obvious, but the transboundary nature of the marine environment demands multilateral cooperation beyond national, national and regional boundaries. We, Ireland, are contributing to international efforts as members of the UN, of the EU, and of the OSPAR Commission for the Northeast Atlantic, including the Arctic. The strategy for a sustainable blue economy is a vital element in EU post-pandemic recovery and the Green Deal. Ireland is chairing the EU Atlantic Strategy Committee to promote entrepreneurship, protect and enhance the marine and coastal environment, improve connectivity, and support socially inclusive regional development. These are regional approaches. In looking to the potential for multilateral action, there are multiple roles that UNCTAD can play as we seek to build a future of sustainable prosperity for all. Since 2007, through our development program, Ireland has supported the Train for Trade Port Management Program, which is a concrete example 
of how UNCTAD can bring port communities together to address the challenges and opportunities arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. The program creates port networks, bringing together public, private and international entities. Ireland has supported the English speaking network of the program since its inception in 2007. And we've seen firsthand the valuable sharing of knowledge between ports in Africa, Asia and the island of Ireland. And this sharing of experience and knowledge is not one way, I should add. We need to learn from each other in the building of climate resilient seaports. And there have been unforeseen benefits, side effects in linking through the program, the ports of Dublin, Belfast and Cork with developing world ports. We have established networks, networks which are assisting in meeting another challenge, that of Brexit and the connect connectivity challenge of changing trade patterns for reasons other than climate change. So I look forward to participating in the official launch of the Train for Trade special course on building port resilience against pandemics uh, on the 22nd of June, which I have seen already is uh, achieving a sort of a very high interest with a lot of participants already re registered. So just uh, to conclude, we noted that yesterday was UN Oceans Day and the UN Oceans Conference will provide a forum to report on progress towards SDG 14, while the UN Decade of the Ocean provides a common framework to ensure that oceans can fully support countries' actions to sustainably manage the oceans and more particularly to achieve the 2030 Agenda. The COVID pandemic has been a wake-up call for our governments and societies. Or if it hasn't, it needs to be. Governments have mobilized financial resources to address the immediate social and economic impact on a scale which had proved politically impossible in response to the science of climate change or the adoption of the 2030 Agenda. As we chart a way towards recovery, it is clear that societies, economies, public and private sector need to adapt to more effective economic models for inclusive and sustainable development and the protection of our planet. Protecting and harnessing the potential of the ocean economy will be an essential element in that recovery from vulnerability and equality to a globally shared prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, and as as we are all going into some poetry, I will also read a little bit of, of a, a little bit of a poem of Psoa from the 20th century, which says, "Oh salty sea, so much of your salt is tears of Portugal, because we crossed you. So many mothers wept, so many sons prayed in vain, so many brides remained unmarried, that you might be ours, O sea. Was it worthwhile?" All is worthwhile when the spirit is not small. So this is a little more dramatic, but I think it really goes to the to show how important the sea is for all of us, and um, uh, and it's it's really it's really something that brings us all together, and it shows, as you said, Michael, that only and others before the only multilateral solutions exist um, to to deal with this issue. Um, now, uh, we'll move now to hear from the perspective of a small island developing state in the African region. Our next panelist is Her Excellency Usha Dwarka Kanabadi, Ambassador and Permanent uh, Representative uh, of the Mauritius to the United Nations in Geneva. Thank you very much, Ambassador Masera, and I thank UNTAD for inviting me to participate in this. I was wondering how many people knew that Africa had islands, because sometimes we tend to forget that. We think of the block on the continent and everybody forgets to put the islands around. But let me please recognize Mr. Humphrey, who has been such an inspiration today with his passion and energy that he feels about water. And Mrs. Durant, as well as all my co-panelists who are here today, all of us inspired by our respective sea. You can see from my background, our sea is always in our office. And it's the same for all my colleagues around the, the mission here. You know, we always say of Mauritius that we are an ocean state. And this is what we are, much more water than land. But being an ocean state makes you very vulnerable. And you still have to make sure that you don't have uninvited guests in your waters. They don't come and pollute that water. And you find suddenly it's like having a house with a big yard and you found suddenly somebody polluted that and you had no say in it and nothing you can do about it. But look, um, 
I'll tell you the truth is that, you know, when you're a fourth panelist, this is the time when everybody takes a break. So I'm not sure how many people are still listening on. And I'm very cross with Ambassador Fevrier for stealing my talking notes. So I've got nothing left to say now. But I want to share a couple of thoughts nonetheless with you and see how we can give Ankar some work on this and what we can do. Let me start with Mauritius and the question they asked me. And they said to me, but you know, Mauritius was one of the first countries to have started out an ocean strategy. And it is true. We did a roadmap initially many years ago. We had some support from the World Bank in doing that. But what happened to the roadmap afterwards? Well, today the ocean economy contributes like 10.3% to the GDP of Mauritius. And what is our ambition? To double that. But easier said than done. If you think of Mauritius today, you think of 2.3 square million kilometers. Now that may not say, uh, that may not ring a bell, but if you think of the size of France and Germany put together, that's exactly the kind of ocean territory we have. So like Ireland, we also can be pretty big as well, but we have a little control over the rest of that island. The second thing that we did was to work with Seychelles. Seychelles and Mauritius were the first two countries to make a joint submission to the United Nations on how they would share out where their exclusive economic zone converges. And today we have a joint management team in place to look after that. So at least we try to get ourselves organized. The 10.3% that I mentioned of, that I mentioned contributes to our GDP, that comes mainly from coastal tourism, from marine leisure, from sports, of course, uh, uh, you know, marine sports, and of course, seafood activities and related activities as well. What we want to do now is to try and move that to maritime services, to sort of marine renewable energy, which could be really something very good for the oceans, but which is very costly, and marine biotechnology, as well as aquaculture. So what are the problems that we faced? I think Mrs. Durant was very kind to say in her opening remarks that many other small island states would depend a lot on coastal tourism, and this has dropped like 70% post-pandemic. The other thing that's happened is the cost of freight. When you look at the cost of freight today, you find that air connectivity may have stopped during the pandemic, but hey, maritime did not stop at all. So suddenly we find that maritime uh, connectivity is carrying on. There is a huge demand suddenly for the few ships. There are logistical problems, so containers are not available to take this forward. The result is what? The result is a Trans-Pacific Asia US West Coast rates are today at 218% times higher than last year. We forget this, but if you're a country like Mauritius, where 99% of your trade depends on marine transport, then you have an issue. And I'm sure there are many small islands like me around there, which says it. This morning I was looking at the figures, recent figures for cost, and I realized, my God, this was $3.06 per mile uh, in April, and it's now already at $0.12 higher. So at this rate, I think we're going to be having some problems. So I'll come to the questions and to ask Ankar what more it could do for us. But let me just share this. Mauritius initially made a lot of heavy investments in infrastructure to increase transshipment volume. And those investments were supposed to pay off for us to meet those costs of investment, the infrastructure investment we have made. With COVID, this is not going to be possible. So now I come to ask you a couple of questions because I would rather hear the questions raised to us. One, given the situation post pandemic, can UNCTAD come up with proposals on how to adjust to such disruptions as the pandemic so that freight rates are kept at reasonable times. You have no magic answer, but I know you do sufficient research to know how to help us. The second thing I wanted to ask Antad, how do we make it possible for people to focus on smaller ports, you know, ports like Polri, so that they can provide midway bulk breaking, for example, they can provide midway distribution. They can become effective distribution centers and increase maritime presence, which is the biggest bane of small island states, lack of connectivity, lack of maritime connectivity. So those are ways that we need to be able to see, let's get practical. Let's try to find ways of making this work for all of us. And let's try to create a link between all of these small island states out there. The second thing is obviously with the pandemic is short-term liquidity absence. All of us have gone into our reserves. All of us have used this to help people in bad situations. So what is this international financing instrument that we can come up with? Could UNCTAD chart out the contours of such a financing instrument? As an example, Mauritius requires $300 million just to develop a breakwater 
to secure port infrastructure. $300 million at this point in time, that's not going to be easy. It may sound like peanuts to a farmer in a big country, but it's, it's a lot of money for us to be able to do that. And I know this is not new. This is not new at all for UNCTAD, because in 2014, we saw UNCTAD coming up and saying, you know, um, already the SIDS are very vulnerable, and we need to provide specific support to SIDS and create a fund for them, so that this is only SIDS-specific support that is given. Let me turn towards something that Stephen Piria mentioned and Marisa Humphrey as well, the question of climate change, the question of natural disasters. Mauritius has had a downtime of some 10 days per year due to adverse weather conditions becoming more frequent. In 2018, the downtime was 41 days. Now to limit the negative impact of same on competitiveness, government has had to invest in new infrastructure. This financing due to climate change could actually have come from green funds, but they did not. The green funds are not flexible enough to be able to respond in real time to the needs of the countries, including post-pandemic. So we'd ask, we would like UNCAD to see how can we ask or how can we suggest, how can we make these green funds more flexible so that we can get financing for real projects as we go along. And I come to the same question on here on marine renewable energies, which should be central to what we're trying to do for the oceans. How can we use green funds to develop this? This is very costly. Today, the cost of generation from, uh, from marine renewable energy is almost prohibitive for small islands. So how can we use these funds which are out there, which are sometimes not used, how can we use that to do things which are good for SDG 14 and 6? And along with that, how do we access technology? I have this big passion about using um, unpatented technology as they become unpatented to make it accessible to people, but somebody needs to do that. Countries, small countries do not know how to go outside and get that technology. So we need people to do that. And the last issue, perhaps the last two issues I want to address, is the issue of coherence, institutional coherence. We all go around doing a lot of things. We will go to Barbados, and I'm so glad it is Barbados. Thank you, Barbados, for hosting on Type 15. We will go there and we will come out with a resolution. I would like to see two things in that resolution. And these are the very two things that UNCAD came up with in 2014, when it was the International Year of the SIDS. The first I have said already to you, SIDS specific support measures, which is financing. And two, UNCAD call for a genuine status for SIDS based on criteria. That hasn't moved there yet. We want to see those two repeated for the work to continue by UNCAD and to achieve that. The other thing we'd like UNCAD to see, how do we develop an integrated approach that will leverage the linkages and Stephen mentioned some of them. How do you bring the Paris Agreement, the Samoa pathway, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the IHE Biodiversity Targets that was talked about so much yesterday. And of course, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. How do we bring them to work together in an integrated manner? Last but not least, and this is a subject I didn't really want to speak about, but my brother from the Pacific, uh, uh, and, and Stephen urged me on because fisheries negotiations at the WTO. What is the role of the multilateral trading system? Sometimes I say to myself in the middle of discussions on fisheries, you know what? I'm going to give up this job of being an ambassador. I'm going to go back being a griot because Africa is running out of griot, those who tell all those tales. Because in 20 years, I would have to explain to the grandchildren of the world why at one time in the world we used to fish fish from oceans. Well, there used to be a sea that we could fish fish from. Today we manufacture them, we get them from factories. You know, I feel so strongly because whilst you need to balance out commercial interests and SDG 14, six, believe me, the priority right now in negotiations is not SDG 14, six. And once we have all given up, once we have all come to that compromise as negotiators do on an agreement in fisheries, once you have given me my carve out for artisanal and small scale fishing, then I will have a number of questions to ask you. If you really, and I say this to the proponents of subsidies, if you really have been taking all the sustainable measures, explain to me how you still need to use subsidies even after a decade of sustainable measures. How do you justify that? I know we need to keep livelihoods and we're willing to find a balance but sometimes it's very frustrating. So the other question I would have to ask you, after we do an agreement, don't we need to do a review? 
don't we need to check in five years or seven years or 10 years time, whether this really brought sustainability? Who's going to do that for us? Antad yesterday brought up two sentences which struck me. It said something, we have the reach, the limit of what can be harvested from the ocean. I could not agree more. But then you come and say that with good fisheries management, um, fish stocks can be maintained or replenished. But WTO is not the place to do fisheries management. So who's going to do the fisheries management for us and come and tell us, hey, this WTO agreement is working and we're actually replenishing. So I would like answers to all of that. I know this is not your usual speech that you wanted. We believe in the ocean. Somebody needs to convince us about the beauty of the ocean. I do want to draw attention, however, on one last thing. And this is a gentleman called Yvan Bourgnon. I've been reading this in the Migros magazine. This man is trying to create a manta that will pick up 10,000 tons of debris, plastics in the oceans. And he cannot even find 38 million to do that, although he's got 60 donors on that one. We have a problem. Let's just put our money where we really need to put it, getting rid of that plastic and doing good things in, in, in future. And since you're all into poetry, the poem in Mauritius is, the destiny of islands is to sing, is to sing and to enchant. Le destin des îles est de chanter et d'enchanter. We hope to continue to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I, I was remiss, in fact, not to mention that you were, you were one of the first countries in the world to define and implement its own oceans economic strategy. And I think it was very interesting for us all to, to learn how you then do follow up on, on that strategy that, that, that you approved. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll now hear uh, the intervention from Mrs. M.A. Gonzalez, Executive Director, Partnerships in Environmental Management for the Seas of East Asia, PEMSIA. This intergovernmental organization operates in East Asia with the objective to foster and sustain healthy and resilient oceans, coasts, communities, and economies across the region. Mrs. Gonzalez will share her views on how the trade and, and marine resource conversation may be mutually supportive. Mrs. Gonzalez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone from uh, the Philippines. Um, His Excellencies, uh, Acting Director General Isabel Duran, uh, fellow panelists, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. I used to work in WWF International in Geneva, so I'm glad to be back into the international advocacy scene albeit uh, remotely. So uh, for my presentation today, I would like to start with just giving an introduction on the East Asian Seas. You know, it's recognized as the center of marine biodiversity globally. It is home to 31% of the world's mangroves, 33% of seagrass beds, and a third of the world's coral reefs. Countries of the East Asian Seas region account for 80% of global aquaculture, and around 60% of the world's capture fisheries. Moreover, the region seas serve as an important conduit for 90% of world trade through shipping. It is the center of economic growth, being home to two large economies, China and Japan. And the combined economies of the ASEAN represents the world's fifth largest economy and the third largest global market with more than 630 million people. But the ocean is under threat, and we all know that. And if we continue business as usual, it's not going to do us any good. Coral reefs are at risk. There's overfishing, destructive fishing, land and sea-based pollution, not to mention plastic leakage into the ocean, habitat conversion. And with marine industries shifting to Asia, there could be more negative cumulative impacts. Now, the current COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented crisis, as uh, many of the speakers have spoken. It has necessitated the implementation of travel restrictions and health protocols, but resulted also in disruptions, if not closure of business operation, particularly in the trade, travel, tourism, fisheries, recycling industry, for example, halted operations during the height of the pandemic, resulting in uh, you know, more plastics um, going into landfills and into the environment, leaking into the environment. This has also resulted in the 65% drop 
in earnings, particularly for informal wage sectors. I mean, uh, the whole uh, economy, uh, the COVID has plunged GDPs across the region and has affected the lives and livelihood of people and the economy, especially women, informal sectors, and other vulnerable groups. Nonetheless, there were also positive impacts as it provided temporary relief to marine species and ecosystems due to reduced travel, tourism, and trade. And there were also some reported short-term recovery of fish biomass as well. COVID has allowed the digitalization of maritime and fishery services with blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things. And it has paved uh, for more maritime trade in goods and services and has shielded offshore renewable energy sector. In the region, uh, uh, you, you talk about poetry, but in the region, you probably know that um, the Chinese proverb that the there's crisis, there's also opportunity. So the COVID-19 crisis has also presented an opportunity for the region to reset and re-engineer the patterns of consumption and production through green blue recovery plans. This, has promote, uh, uh, this in, uh, includes promoting activities, policies, and investments that have positive impact on the environment while improving the economy and addressing health and other socioeconomic concerns. Yesterday, during the World Ocean Day, 10 countries in the region actually presented their blue-green economic recovery plans with examples of how they are putting blue economy uh, at the core of these policies. Uh, some of the plans uh, pushed for carbon neutral neutrality to 2050. Others push for nature-based solutions with mangrove reforestation to help with employment, combating climate change, and at the same time, restoring habitats and spawning grounds. There were other countries also who pushed for an integrated approach to plastic waste reduction, uh, calling for developing markets for recycling, pushing for phase out on the um, uh, problematic and unnecessary single-use plastics, also looking into um, um, you know, improving solid waste management systems, as well as uh, design for plastic circularity. Now, these plans will feed into an East Asian Seas Roadmap up to 2030, which will serve as the guiding framework for the partnerships work on ocean governance in the region. So in, in, uh, with, uh, um, in terms of uh, ONGTAD, we are open to partnership with ONGTAD to implement some of this work on uh, the Blue Green Reco Recovery Program, especially in the field of sharing best practices and sustainable solutions to facilitate trade in sustainable ocean-based goods and services, especially in capture fisheries and aquaculture, coastal tourism, also Mart, uh, maritime transport connectivity, digitalization, particularly for small medium enterprises and uh, the vulnerable groups, and also at the local level. So we would also like to, uh, uh, to work with UNCTAD uh, on building technical, creating technical assistance to build capacity and provide um, enabling conditions, for example, to um, have some investments on uh, a new and developing new business models and financing mechanisms, which can be le leveraged to accelerate blue economy invest investments, for example, in ecotourism, sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, seafood processing, green ports, green ships, and marine engineering, marine renewable energy, marine biotechnology. There are so many needs in the regions as well, as these countries, you know, we have the richest countries, but we all also have the poorer, poorer countries and some LDCs. So there are so many of these. There is also um, um, needs for incentives for commer commercialization in emerging blue economy industries, looking for alternatives to plastics, the, the socioeconomic impacts of facing out single-use plastics and all these things. So there are so many um, uh, ways that um, UNCTAD and PEMC could work together, and we look forward to having these discussions. Thank you. I, I see uh, Mr. Ani already there, so I think he's ready for his speech. <laughs> All right. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Gonzalez, for very interesting remarks and 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 clues to to further work. Um, now, last but not least, we will hear from Mr. Henri Banham, Honorary President of the International Oceans Institute. Mr. Banham will discuss how to strengthen the role of capacity building, technology transfer, and partnerships in enabling a sustainable ocean economy. We very much look forward to your intervention, Mr. Bannon. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for uh, your introduction. Um, uh, coming as the, the last uh, speaker, you have one has the feeling that you're moving from the sublime after all this wonderful presentation to the mundane. And I hope it does not turn that way. I'm trying, ah, it's open. Um, Capacity building, uh, uh, which we, we now, of course, we all know we, we call capacity development. The overarching objective of, of capacity building is to develop and impart a holistic approach to the challenges and opportunities in the governance and management of oceans and coast by living with the ocean and from the ocean in a sustainable relationship. Ocean-related practitioners, whether mid-high-level government officials, private sector, state entities, NGOs, scientists, etc., as stakeholders in the evolution of the health of the ocean and coast and sustainable use of ocean resources and services, must adapt to and function in the wider perspective than their own individual uh, place in a sustainable ocean economy. The ocean the relative to the extent of their exposure to the total sum of ocean literacy, stakeholders would have to come to terms with the bigger picture of which they may not be aware in managing sustainably their relationship in any ocean related activity or sector. I'm not going to dwell on how we be transferred from technical assistance to capacity building and now to um, capacity development, except to say that the interface be be between ocean economy and uh, uh, policies and sustainable development strategy should be seen in relation to empowering current and future policymakers, stakeholders, particularly in states of developing countries, countries in transition with instruments to be rooted in their national policies. Consequently, there are, there are several capacity development needs in terms of education, training, research, formulation, implementation of international and national legislation, regulatory framework, etc. Normally, bilateral multilateral development agencies aid in either one of the components of an integrated ocean economy policy or in some specific topics within them. The productive sector, fisheries, maritime, bio, trade, shipping ports, harbor, or in the design and implementation and negotiation strategies, links to regional and global programs or support services. An integrated approach in the linkage between the three areas, individuals, societal, and institutional, are complex and have direct implications on the way in which capacity development is designed. By linkages, it, it is referred to div a diversity of connections, feedback and causalities that appear in policymaking and, and lawmaking processes. It is a process entailing human resource development combined with a stronger institution in the three cross layers, as we said, capacity, and of individual, institutional, and societal. These three layers are pertinent to an integrated ocean governance, no matter where the focus lies. To superimpose the ocean economy policies 
implies collaborating and formulating and implementing ocean development strategies that is embedded in a broader national development strategy, strengthening ocean policy and institutions as a basis for generating economic and social benefits. I, I will not dwell more on that it's, uh, to, to, to save time. And I will go to the role of UNCTAD. Today, UNCTAD has an opportunity to initiate a human-centered capacity development process that would make a difference in achieving sustainable ocean economy, imperative through establishing and strengthening national and regional centers for training of trainers and by re replicating a great success of UNCTAD in the past. I think the, uh, the Ambassador Gaffey uh, mentioned uh, this. First, we have to be aware that UNCTAD major contribution in the area of maritime trade and transport logistics through knowledge-based capacity building when developing countries face enormous challenge in the early 70s. I was there to witness it. When we had containerization, an evolving challenge of new technology, UNCTAD instituted an ambitious training project financed by the Swedish CEDA and UNDP to establish and strengthen local trading centers, both national and regional, to meet the challenge of containerization, with an aim to train 100 managers a year in the 70s. The project was tra training of trainers, train more, became the most successful programs of UNCTAD in the process of which 50,000 managers were trained and developing countries met the, and overcame the challenge of fast evolving technology in shipping and ports development. UNCTAD in meeting the challenge of preparing human resources for sustainable ocean economy, uh, which would need a kaleidoscope of expertise and managers and operators at all levels, had a, a project that empowered versatile multitasking managers who were able to replicate uh, uh, on a continuous basis and provide the human resources necessary. Both the experience and the model which could be and, and should be emulated and reconstructed to provide the necessary human resources for critical immediate needs of a sustainable ocean economy. The second point that I wish to bring here on the role of UNCTAD is uh, the fact that UNCTAD as a knowledge-based institution has demonstrated over the years the importance of flagship publications that are used consistently as a primary source of information, analysis, and basis for policy formulation for all stakeholders, including the academia and ocean literacy in the broader sense. An enduring example is the review of maritime transport a document that has become a principal tool in the expansion of operation and knowledge based on scientific analysis, providing analytical uh, statistic and exposure to the latest developments in maritime trade, whether operational, environmental, economic, social logistics, and, uh, and by addressing the value chain connectivity. For developing countries, it's considered a principal tool for capacity building and literacy. There is no similar compendium for ocean economy in all its sectors, but interdependent imperatives that the ocean economy is made of. It is therefore opportune to build on that experience of UNCTAD to produce something like a biennial ocean economy review for sustainable development that would cover the economic, social, environmental development dimensions to bridge the gap between myopic institutional silos and narrow sectorial narratives. The proposed knowledge-based ocean economy review with a statistical analysis, strategic information of the bigger and inclusive narrative for linking the so many going on ongoing processes for the ocean living and non-living resources and services 
would provide a wealth of one-stop information and technology for policymakers, civil societies, and communities to manage human interaction with global ocean economy, driven by the imperative the age, of, the age of ocean neglect and, and lethargy has come to an end. Given the global commitment today to multiple processes, as in the SDGs, BBNJ, climate change, UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainability, UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, Ocean Alliances, the US Proclamation of National Ocean Month 2021, Ocean Foundations, an outstanding emergence emergency of, of citizen science, global monitoring system, digitization. So the need is to bring these together. ANCTAD uh, 15 is once in a lifetime opportunity to contribute to sustainable e ocean economy by having this link, a particular link of all the processes, including the climate change for sustainability for generations to come. So we would have a tool that will be part of our redemption that we all seek for the unconscionable damage and neglect we have inflicted as humans on the health of the ocean. It's perhaps opportune at Antarctic 15 in Barbados to mandate such a project as an ocean development review based on multi-institutional cooperation for capacity development objective to ensure that all individual or community, no matter in which working dimension can have access to analytical statistics, knowledge-based practices, latest innovation technology in various interrelated sectors of the blue economy, and especially to equip practitioners in multitasking capacity, a multi-organizational operation and the development of a sustainable ocean economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think your intervention as always has been very helpful. The importance of multitasking and the importance of having people that know different subjects and, and working together, of course. it's. It's, it's, it's all very important. I think I, I'll now take advantage of the fact that, uh, that Mrs. Duran is still with us. So I, um, I'll, I'll give her the floor so that she can answer some of the, of the many questions that, that were put forward. And then uh, if there's any more uh, elements that our panelists who, who would, would like to add, I'll first give the floor to the panelists in, in the order that they, that they spoke first. So I, I will um, start then after Mrs. Durand with Ambassador Février, and I'll go to the other speakers in case they want to add something. If there are more questions on the second round of questions, I'll do it the other way around to keep fairness. But we start now with Mrs. Durand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, um, I, I'm not a specialist in the detail of ocean. And Minister uh, Amfrey set the bar very high, uh, and I thank him for that because I think that uh, it's it's important for all of us to not only regarding inspiration and what means be an island, but it's important to remind that because sometimes we are so technocratic in a way to discuss that we forget uh, people like me from countries with 60 kilometers of coast, so uh, 60 kilometers of Belgium. So, uh, uh, and I am living in Swiss with the lake. So it's not my origin which motivate my engagement uh, on, on oceans, but more, of course, the, the global question. But thank you for, for this inspiration. So um, yes, first of all, I would like to say to Ms. Mr. Humphrey that yes, the political will of Barbados is key. And I think and I feel that it changed a lot, of course, in only in the speech at that stage. But I think that it's important that the political will 
to, to recover differently and to take into consideration a lot of things through another method as in the past uh, uh, or the last uh, 10 years, that's really key regarding especially climate change and post-COVID. So I encourage Barbados, but I know Madame Motley and I know also her, her dynamism uh, in order not to, 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 to be absent of this discussion. Secondly, um, I would like to, to answer or to give some element to Madame Ambassador of Mauritius because she spoke about the possible uh, agreement in the WTO on fisheries. We'll see on what we can find an agreement or you, the member states could find an agreement, but whatever is the quality of the, the agreement and if probably it's not sufficient, you can count on UNCTAD uh, in order to uh, support the implementation of the, of the report, the, the review of the report, especially on fish management support, uh, on what is related to uh, livelihoods for small scale uh, coast uh, uh, people and, and especially fishers. So I think that on that we will stay present and mandated to do that. That's our job. Uh, Madame Ambassador also uh, mentioned some unfair practic practices from some partners regarding subsidies and I agree with her uh, that's something which is really problematic but yes uh, we have to, to 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 look at that and I agree that it's not easy to explain that for the next generation how we could continue to subsidize this kind of things without taking to enough to account uh, the question of uh, allotic resources and necessity to protect oceans Bon, I hope that an agreement could be done in the, in the WTO and that we can go further uh, in the future. Um, what about um, the, the financing? It's true that um, you have to know that even if green recovery or green issues or climate issue are not sufficiently funded, it's less for blue. So green is more or less finance. Blue is totally I will not say absent, but not so really present in the budget in order to support development. It's why we have to continue to speak about this blue economy in with a multifaceted approach, as it was said by the different uh, panelists. Finally, yes, we need money because the financing will help in infrastructure. There is no development of blue economy on a good way without uh, uh, investment in infrastructure first. And secondly, I heard very well what was asked by some, especially the representative of the small island, the necessity to have a kind of specific statute for, for those islands. And we are, you know that uh, we are working on an index of vulnerabilities, but I think that we have probably to do more in order to really uh, um, address those specific vulnerabilities of small islands. So uh, just to let you know, and why I ask the floor, not to go into detail because David Vivas and all the team in UNCTAD working on that are better, uh, better than, than I. Nevertheless, it was important for me politically to let you know that it's something which is important for UNCTAD. It's not for nothing that we are organizing UNCTAD 15 uh, with Barbados. Uh, and we will do our best in order to really vulgarize, socialize, and increase the importance uh, to work on those issues, especially uh, what, we, what, what I said about fish management support and implementation of an agreement, if there is an agreement, because we know that an agreement is sometimes so complex that for a lot of developing countries, have, with a lack of data and information, it's really difficult to apply it and then to review. So it's why it's important to, to be there to do that with you. So count on us uh, in UNCTAD 15, but also before and after. So that was just what I, 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 would, I wanted to say at that stage. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Durand. Um, I would now, um, well, as, as many of those answers had to do with the questions put forward by Ambassador Dwarke Kanabadi. Uh, uh, we have another another question um, on on the chat box, which is, I'd like to learn more about how the panelists are looking to invest in sustainable offshore energy moving forward. What plans are in place? How are they considering the needs of the energy sector while also considering the needs of the fisheries and aquaculture communities? So I will now um, pass the floor to our, our panelists. 
And as I said, maybe I, I can go through the order of the, of the speakers. I uh, want to know if uh, Stephen Fevrier has anything to add. And if not, I'll move in that order to the other panelists. Thank Stephen, you. Do you have something? Yeah. Um, perhaps I could speak to the question of energy first, and then maybe share a few other reflections. Uh, permit me to share my thoughts on the uh, preparedness of small island economies to transition uh, to greener forms of energy, particularly marine-based energy. Uh, I believe there is, has been quite a bit of discussion on this theme, and of course there is uh, an abundance of uh, energy which could be harvested from the oceans. However, I think in most cases, uh, specifically in the context of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, uh, we are currently working on uh, marine spatial planning, as well as assessing through detailed uh, reports and uh, plans what would be the uh, cost of developing the energy, what would be the requirements regulatorily uh, in terms of regulations, in terms of uh, the legal infrastructure. Uh, we also have some challenges relative to existing uh, supply arrangements with the uh, monopoly uh, energy suppliers and how the, those new sources of energy could be integrated into the grid based on uh, long-standing uh, supply uh, agreements, which those energy monopoly energy suppliers have with governments. So it, it is uh, not necessarily, uh, it's a very complex uh, question. One, uh, the cost of access, ensuring that you have the regulation and the uh, marine spatial plans uh, in place. And then you have the second fifth part, which would be uh, ensuring that the existing suppliers would be able to benefit from those supplies given uh, predated, pre-existing supply agreements which are uh, legally entrenched and legally supported. So uh, there has been some conversations and in fact, uh, in earlier this year, a document was produced uh, which would start the conversation, hopefully which would lead to uh, further uh, exploration of the policy framework required for offshore and marine energy. Um, so we are hopeful that that will be uh, an outcome of that discussion. Let me also say that um, there is also a need to ensure that there's coherence, coherence uh, between the existing uh, organizations, uh, World Bank, um, the IMF, regional institutions, um, not only on the question of energy, but more broadly on the question of the blue economy, uh, ensuring that the technical assistance and capacity building is aligned with the financial resources which should be made available to build out the capacity and to lay down the infrastructure. I think also there must be an approach to looking at coherence, I believe, um, that has been raised before. Uh, between the nationally determined uh, commitments, um, commitments made at the WTO and higher level SDG-related SDG commitments with specific national development priorities. So rather than acting at cross purposes and diluting the resources which we have in short supply, ensuring to the greatest possible extent that there is a uh, focus on addressing those issues which are cross-cutting in a more harmonious way but again, this can only be achieved where there is coherence uh, being built both institutionally, um, but also at the level of uh, member states. One of the things that we have been trying to do at the OECS is through our, our regional development plan uh, so that uh, we are more targeted and focused on addressing the issue, uh, this notwithstanding what commitment is uh, the source of that issue, whether it's be national determined contributions under the UNFCCC or uh, SDGs or WTO related commitments. Um, finally, of course, on finance, uh, and again, that relates to coherence, there is a need to scale up access to finance uh, because policy documents and great 
policy analysis is really not valuable to the extent that there is an absence of accessible finance, not only for the private, uh, not only for the public sector, only for governments, but to provide seed capital for investable and bankable opportunities in those sectors by the private sector. So there is a need to ensure that the IFIs and other development partners establish uh, accessible envelopes uh, to uh, provide uh, business opportunities, viable business opportunities in those sectors, uh, the opportunity to uh, bring to market some of the goods and services which are sustainable and which would uh, create the necessary uh, financial and economic uh, developmental impetus that we uh, so uh, very much need. Final point would be um, the Transportation infrastructure. Um, I know Regina, who is on the call, has worked with us on transportation infrastructure and ensure that there is a clear mapping of transportation infrastructure to ensure that those vulnerabilities for our ports, our seaports, are well understood, particularly in the face of raising our water levels uh, brought about by climate change. That work, we believe, is important. Uh, we need to ensure that UNCTAD. Uh, to the extent possible, could continue assisting uh, small states map the, those vulnerabilities. Uh, because if we don't have access to ports, then we have zero tourism. Um, if we don't have access to seaports, then we have little capacity to feed ourselves and to provide the goods which are vital to our economies. So I just want to also uh, record that we are quite interested in continuing this work uh, for uh, which, which we will believe uh, could give us some insights uh, on our uh, infrastructural vulnerabilities uh, related to the maritime sector uh, so that we could take the necessary steps and hopefully access the financing and resources so that we could uh, build up the, uh, let's say, resilience of those port and transportation facilities to what is the uh, ever uh, present danger of climate change related hazards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, if um, any of, of the other panelists who would like to add something on this list of questions, I'll be very happy to, to pass the floor. I think that um, I can make a short reference uh, on, a, on a point made by our colleague from Mauritius that, I mean, WIPO actually has, a, has an instrument to facilitate the matching of technology, um, of green technology. And of course, it, it's lots about green and not enough uh, about blue. But I think that's an area that can maybe be uh, explored. Uh, then I understand that Regina can answer questions on ports and mar maritime transport and on fisheries and blue economy, David can add something. But before we go to that, we have a few minutes. I wonder if um, any other of the panelists want to add something. Um, Michael, do you want to add okay, something so sure. far? Yeah, I'll just, say, I'll just say one or two very quick things. Uh, first, picking up, because it's of a, it's a direct uh, relevance to, to, to our national experience, the question of uh, energy because um, we've, we've come a little late. We, we've, be, we've been a little late uh, on, on renewable energy in Ireland, but we've, we've got a great ambition now. We have set our ambition to achieve net zero emissions no later than 2050 and a 51% reduction in emissions by the end of this decade. So this it requires a huge shift. We have a domestic goal of 70% of renewable ec electricity by 2030. And we are lucky because uh, we have huge offshore energy potential in Ireland. And what's required is development of really significant offshore renewable energy generation capacity and grid infrastructure over the coming decade. So this is a massive challenge for us at, at, at the moment. Um, and, um, you know, we're an island sitting in the Atlantic. This should have been obvious to us before now, but I think humans are slow. Humans are slow learners. But our programme for government commits now to the achievement of five gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 and a long term plan to take advantage of a potential of at least 30 gigawatts thereafter. So what we, our ambition then is to have the resource potential to connect with our neighbours by sea to become a major contributor to a pan-European renewable energy generation 
and transmission system. So that's just that on, on Ireland. But just to say uh, briefly, the um, the UNCTAD, UNCTAD and, and UNCTAD 15, you know, we've known for a few years that this was a huge opportunity for UNCTAD to demonstrate its relevance to global challenges. And I think that's even clearer now after the, uh, as, as we come through, hopefully, the, the pandemic. And in looking at the agenda a number of years ago, two years ago, before the pandemic, it was clear across the board, there was really no, 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 no big disagreement that one issue that needed to be taken up was the impact of climate trade, climate change, sorry, climate change on trade patterns, shifting trade patterns as a result of climate change, which have a huge development uh, impact. And I think after the experience of the pandemic, one thing we realize is we need a new understanding of risk because uh, for most of us, apart from maybe a small number of, of, of Asian states, we did not prepare for the risk of the, of the pandemic that hit us. Uh, and yet that pandemic is not necessarily the most serious pandemic that could have hit us or maybe that will hit the world. So we, weren't, we, we, we really need to understand better our, 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 to improve our understanding of and preparation for risk. And we know that climate change is more than a risk. It's in all of our risk registers everywhere, but we haven't prepared properly. So I think that's why I say that I think COVID-19 hopefully is a wake up call for us on more than health issues but just on the reality of risk. Uh, looking then to um, UNCTAD 15, we're negotiating the outcome document at the moment. And that sometimes, as we all know, is a bit of a torturous process as everybody fights for their paragraph and their word in it. But I do personally think that the opportunity of the hosting of this uh, conference by a small island development state should not be lost. When you talk about special status for SIDS, Obviously, landlocked countries come and they talk about their special development needs, but we can we 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 can find the balance there. It would be it really would I think personally be very uh, a very good outcome if we could have agreement on some special status specific status for SIDS recognizing their specific vulnerabilities. I heard the Prebish, le Prebish lecture by uh, Prime Minister Motley of Barbados just two years ago, and there is a real sense among the small island development states that the reality of the challenges they face is not being heard. So that's that's one thing I'd say that we need to take the opportunity of UNCTAD 15 for. And, and then uh, our last speaker, Arne Benham, said he hoped he wasn't being too mundane, but he made one really important practical recommendation, I think, which is the, you know, UNCTAD is a knowledge-based institution and the work and the, the, the research that, that, that goes on and in, in, that, that is produced from UNCTAD is really important. Sometimes it gets eclipsed by the sometimes ideological debates that we all engage in in, in in UNCTAD. But I think that proposal for a biannual ocean economy review could be extremely in, in, in important, both in highlighting the relevance of UNCTAD to debate, but more importantly, in, as a contribution by UNCTAD to a breaking down the silos and, and, and the thematic silos that are, that are inhibiting us from um, addressing addressing the challenge of the blue, of the ocean economy and the opportunity of the ocean economy. So I think that's one specific suggestion that I think will be, could very importantly be taken forward. So thank you to all the, all the other panelists as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, yeah, if I can speak just a second about Portugal. Yes, I mean, we, we are very ambitious about renewables also. But we, 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 we have hydro, we have solar, and we have lots of wind inland also. So, I mean, nowadays, we, we already have almost a week uh, in winter where 100% of our electricity is, is renewable. And on, on average, over the year, it's around 55, 58% of our electricity is renewable. But because we have so much inland, we were slow <laughs> to look into the ocean so and because our sea is so deep uh, uh, basically what uh, what we need in terms of wind energy in, in the sea is deep sea floating uh, wind energy we we cannot do uh, with uh, in, on shallow waters because we, we don't have much of those and of course because we have the islands in the Atlantic the Azores and Madeira we are also an island country 
and we on the mainland we face erosion on on, on some of our low lying areas. Um, so I think uh, this is just to show that we can relate to most of what has been said. Uh, and um, so now I think maybe we could have I don't know if uh, Usha Kanabadi wants to add something before I I, I go to. Uh, Amy, and then we go back to Regina and David. Thank you, Ambassador. And I'm always happy to hear you say Portugal is an island. Ambassador Machado says the same thing to me always. And I say a different, different uh, island, different type of island altogether. But I mean, coming back to the energy issue, I, I think what's important is reaching renewable energy, whether it comes from land as in Portugal or from the sea. We have the sea as an access, so I think we try to use that. In Mauritius, we've tried wave and wind, hasn't worked out very well. Then what we have done is try something called deep ocean water applications, DOA. So this is using basically you're using cold water using a sort of pyroelectric generation to be able to produce energy. Why did why did we think of this? We thought of this because we spend we we spend a lot of money on air conditioning. Coastal tourism means that you have to air condition your hotels. So you don't want to be using all that energy towards that air conditioning when you could use the water, the salt water there. It demanded that we desalinate the water first and then we can do the air conditioning sort of thing. But Hitachi is, uh, has been in Mauritius for some time looking at this. Unfortunately, it hasn't crystallized yet. And I mean, uh, the reason why I asked so many questions and I, I really want to thank Mr. Durant for taking time to answer some of them, some of the answers I know. And I think we discovered such a load of information from UNCTAD when we had our oil spill. Now, we haven't spoken about oil spills today, but the oil spill in Sri Lanka recently pushed up plastics as far as Mauritius. This is the reality with which we live. It's not a written article somewhere, it's a reality. So we discovered that they do a lot of things, and I think David has been engaging, and we're happy to take the conversation further. But what, why we raise the questions is for UNCTAD to carry these forward for us in UNCTAD 15. We need a we need mandate to do more. We need a mandate to focus on islands. And we need UNCTAD to create a group of small islands focused on oceans. Don't worry about the other things, we'll come to there. But focus on oceans, how we use the oceans, create that. I would have gone to the Commonwealth, but not all small island states are members of the Commonwealth, although they have the tradition of having small island states. But thank you for that energy. We are still trying, we're not there yet. We hope to get there soon, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Amy Gonzalez, do, do you want to add something now? Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, offshore renewable energy is gaining traction in Asia, actually. It's one of those um, sectors that has been shielded from the COVID-19 pandemic impact, and China has been leading the, the charge, in which more than half of the global offshore wind uh, expansion really coming from from China. I think it's also the unique geography that lends itself to that. Um, other countries, uh, Korea, Japan is also leading that. Philippines also, it's, it has gained traction. Um, uh, it has, uh, you know, installed capacity of 427 megawatts and, and has awarded um, around 66 projects of, of wind, wind farms. And, and these wind farms, particularly in coastal areas, have also become tourist attraction themselves. People go and, and see this. And um, we, we used to see this in Denmark and uh, in the Scandinavian countries, but in Asia, it, it's happening now as well. Of course, um, in some other countries like Vietnam, it's still in the pilot stage. So it really varies, depends on the country, but there is um, a desire to have marine renewable energy as like some of those uh, frontier blue technologies uh, added into the energy mix. So that's quite encouraging from the region and it's a desire to you know a win win situation with economic with the economy of it as well as uh, environment responding to climate change now um, on the question of balancing between aqua and fisheries and also on um, energy needs as, as Stephen Fabier said uh, marine spatial planning is a good tool for that the greater coastal management is uh, the mechanism that we apply here in Asia as well, and that has worked uh, well in terms of multi-stakeholder consultation, trying to balance competing and multiple use needs as well. So I think that that's very important. Social inclusion also is quite important. 
um, on that. Now, going to uh, Angtad 15, um, I think it's very fitting that Barbados is, uh, you know, has uh, agreed to host this because um, Barbados actually it has very good examples in terms of operationalizing integrated coastal management through natural capital uh, mechanisms. So um, I think there are some examples that should be highlighted from, from, from the experience in Barbados in terms of balancing competing needs between aquaculture, tourism, fisheries, industries, and oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Only Bannon, on. do you want to add something? Okay, no. Um, the one issue is capacity building, the human resources, the, the practitioners, and all these issues, whether it's sea level rise, whether it's uh, offshore uh, energy, etc. How are we going to get the human resources equipped and tooled and be able to understand the bigger picture that so we need more cooperation among institutions that are uh, there for training, for education, for uh, looking at, uh, looking even at the uh, literacy of the uh, ocean economy. And, and we, we need to find better ways of co working together, cooperating between those institutions, for instance, our institutions and, and Agdad, we can work together, we can cooperate, we can partner uh, and this way, we, we we would we would also focus on the transfer of technology and knowledge, etc. So the human resource in this trying to solve all the problems is remain has to remain at the center of our focus also. Thank you very much. Uh, I I would now give the floor briefly to Regina and then to David. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, and uh, I'm sure I speak for all colleagues who are uh, on this call. Thank you all very, very much for your considered and very thoughtful uh, remarks. There were a few particularly uh, concrete questions, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to say something about this, from the uh, Distinguished Ambassador of Mauritius. Uh, it would be interesting to see Angtad come up with proposals on how to adjust disruptions and keep freight at reasonable prices in times of pandemic and also maybe to support uh, smaller port ports in uh, efforts at midway bulk breaking and so on. We're listening very carefully uh, to this um, and uh, we'll reflect on, on, on how we can do this. In terms of UNCTAD 15, of course, it is very important uh, to recall that uh, the decision on uh, setting the priorities is, is for the member states. And so it is uh, the distinguished uh, delegates that are here and would like UNCTAD to uh, intensify certain areas of work to make this clear as part of the negotiations. Uh, on the specific issue of, um, of uh, transport costs and on also on the costs of disruptions and the example they're given for, was from Mauritius, 300 million for a breakwater and the downtime. Uh, of climate uh, related extreme events, some 10 days per year. And in 2018, this had risen to 41 days. This goes very much to the heart of some of the types of issues that we've been trying to, uh, to raise for a number of years. And that is, uh, sits more than others, but generally global trade de depends on functioning uh, ports. And that is capital intensive, of course, uh, and the, the costs that impacts may have is not just the direct damage because this is relatively small fry in the scheme of things and we have seen now with COVID uh, it's like a cautionary tale we see what can happen if we don't prepare and plan and increase resilience before something happens and I, I would very much hope that uh, the thought of how much we depend on these uh, functioning transport links and, and have, to, um, have to strengthen uh, their, their resilience so that we can minimize disruption and minimize trade related losses uh, is, 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 a, is a very important point. And the ambassador Gaffey has also mentioned the point of this uh, being effectively a kind of business risk, which we, which we have to 
uh, consider. So we, we are, uh, you know, we are very much prepared to help in every uh, regard in this, in this context. And we very much hope that this can be given some, some um, importance as part of the negotiations. Just quickly on the integration on policy coherence, this is a key point. Uh, again, uh, the ambassador of Mauritius has pointed this, uh, posed the question, can we chart out an integrated approach? Synergy is critical because after all, there is no di difference between uh, development and uh, the other issues. All of this is necessary for development and development gains can be lost. And finally, on this issue of marine renewable uh, energy, it would seem that that has is enormous promise, particularly for SIDS, that spend a lot of their energy, for example, on air condition, for example, on transport, and a lot of their foreign revenue. So renewable energy makes eminent sense going forward. It also contributes to climate change mitigation and will reduce expenditure. And in the, in the light of, for instance, heat as a factor of climate change in future going forward, that too is, is, is very important. So I, I would also very much hope that mechanisms can be found at, an, at a high level event um, at which our uh, Secretary General uh, participated at the COP in uh, 2019. Uh, the uh, issue was discussed on the topic of, of this for SIDS, was discussed of maybe uh, blue bonds being a possibility. So I'm not, uh, I'm, it is not uh, anything, I have anything specific to say, but I think it would be worth looking at this in a synergetic uh, way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now give the floor to David. Thank you, Ambassador. Can you listen? Yes, perfect. So get some points on, 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 on the questions and issues raised today. I think a, a first point is that we can see through the richness of the debate how this issue that seems to be an issue of a specialist is huge not only in size, but also in the complexity of the governance, the topics, the issue, the ecosystem. So it shouldn't be underestimated. And that complexity is one of the biggest challenge, challenges in moving the uh, blue economy or the ocean economy forward. Just to mention, one of the questions was about policy coherence and the need to, to generate uh, uh, linkages between the Paris Agreement, Samoa Pathway, and the CBD. Uh, this becomes even more complex when we think that now we have in parallel Four multilateral processes trying to fill gaps on the ocean's governance, and two of them are on the economic side. These are related to the WTO Fish of Seas uh, Agreement that could come. This is related to the negotiations on a treaty on biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction in New York. And also we have proposals for a treaty on marine debris and plastic pollution. So there are already regulatory issues that we need to address and respond with urgency. And we are already proposing capacity building and, and activities in this regard to uh, also give to the ocean's governance part, which is not very used to the economic and trade debate, to bring it closer. That's why we have uh, the, the ONTAC Forum on Trade Related Aspect of SDG 14. The first one will be organized next year. And the objective of that forum is to bring the concerns, the proposals, the recommendations of the Geneva multilateral trade community, where all the multilateral agencies are on trade, by the way, to the New York setting, which this is less known and, and they are less used to this type of work. On, on the topic of these subsidies, I, a, a very, very important questions. There are many technicalities that will need to be resolved. SNDP is essential component, even in the mandate, not only of the WTO, but uh, of the SDG target six. Uh, ONTAC has proposed together with FAO and UNEP an interagency plan of action to support countries in that transition. We call on donors to support that plan so we are ready and able to implement as soon as the agreement comes. Uh, on the proposal of uh, about the annual oceans economy review, I think it's very welcome. Uh, and we have a set of products, uh, by the way, inspired in the Mauritius experience, as Seychelles experience, called Oceans Economy and Trade Strategy at the national level. We're supporting Belize, Barbados, and Costa Rica to develop their own oceans economy strategy in key ocean-based sectors. To have a biannual economic review could help us each two years to have an analysis of the trends of the blue economy and also to zoom on key areas that member states would like to. And in this sense, whether these or other proposals are recommendation to member states, we tend to get in on that very general mandates. The more precise are your requests, the easier the easiest is for us to respond to those. So 
one key recommendation for member staying on tax 15 in the blue economy is be specific. The more specific, the better. So we can have a targeted response that fits our mandate and contributes to the overall efforts by the UN and other EU. A point on the proposal by Ambassador uh, Maceira on WIPO Green. Yes, there is a, a matching system that facilitates license to enable transfer of technology uh, on convenient basis under WIPO. Uh, this system is interesting. It still is very green and mostly focused on, on renewable energy and certain technologies. Uh, Ontrack has recently developed a classification on ocean's economy, ocean-based ocean goods and services. That classification could be used both in goods and services to have an spin-off on a classification for technologies needed in the blue economy with a specificity and linked to the patent classifications of WIPO. That doesn't exist. Again, perhaps this is not, uh, I'm not surprised about this in the sense that the blue economy is a relatively new issue. It's only four years. The first time blue economy was mentioned by the way, by Rip and by Aoni Benham here present was in 2014. So we're, yes, six, seven years since the concept was introduced. So we don't have a classification of blue economy technologies. We don't have even a specific, and this is linked to the fund and financing question. We don't have a specific lines of finance support in development banks in the World Bank. They have a program on the blue economy. They have not been developed. So this is a new frontier that we're trying to achieve. For example, I would recommend that an important source of funding is the JEF, who is moving very fast, as well as the World Bank on the blue economy. Uh, another point on finance. Finance is very important, but as important as finance is investment. We need to recover investment in the near future after COVID, especially in the green and in the blue. And there are interesting pilots in countries. And one, one that I saw personally and we held was uh, the, the joint venture between uh, GDF and, 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 and Suez in Vanuatu to have the first uh, uh, windmill farm. And the half of the electricity produced when there was no wind was coconut oil, who is very common in the island. So there are ways that we can use joint, invent, joint venture, investment, co-financing, blended finance to attract the size of the massive investment we need for important infrastructure change, ports, research and development, uh, 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 electric and uh, energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so thank you for, for the points we're trying to respond and it has been very fascinating and tell us that, that we have a, 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 a huge homework before us. So happy to respond. <laughs> thank you very much, David. Um, as, as we ap approach fast the end of our allotted time, um, I would like to give the floor back to each speaker for two minutes to briefly share a final message on what they see as the most pressing issue that needs to be addressed in order to enable a sustainable ocean economy and how policymakers can help in this regard. So this, this will be your two minute uh, pitch uh, before, before, before we close. I, I, I start with Ambassador Stephen Fevrier. So th th thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, I think most of what I would have wanted to say to your final question has already been said uh, by uh, speakers uh, far more eloquent uh, in expressing it than maybe I have. But I, I would just like to, again, share my profound uh, sense of duty that we have and should have and ought to have uh, as it relates to finding some solution on uh, unsustainable uh, use of subsidies. Uh, it's not only a matter which relates to, uh, let's say, uh, preserving uh, our, our fish, but it's also a question of ensuring that um, those small states which don't have the resources to uh, provide uh, huge amounts of subsidies that their fishers uh, can have access to the ocean uh, in a sustainable manner um, and generate sufficient revenue to feed their families and to ensure that their small commercial operations uh, remain viable. Uh, so that's number one. And we all have a role, I believe, to play in landing, uh, finding a landing zone on this issue uh, before the end of 2021. The second one, and I believe it was uh, quite uh, well put by 
ambassador uh, kind of body, which is relative to coherence. Uh, I believe we are focusing on the same issue through many different lenses. And some of those policy lenses are disconnected from access to finance. And access to finance uh, is really important, both from a public sector, public facing standpoint, governments have to have the resources to build infrastructure to ensure that policy transition can take place. But also from a private sector standpoint, that the uh, access to equity um, and finance, which the major uh, global markets are providing for companies in the US, in China, in China, in the sector, in sectors which relate to batteries and renewable energy, that we are not, we don't fall too far behind, that there is also access to finance for innovative technologies in the small island developing states using the existing technologies, technologies and natural assets that we have so that we too can uh, really find a uh, domestic in industries which could maybe compete or better yet augment uh, the technologies uh, that we will be augmenting. So again, coherence uh, is important. Um, and again, I would, I would end by, by saying that advocacy uh, is a huge driver. Sometimes uh, it is the case, and as I believe now, that uh, consumer choice and consumer preferences are ahead of policymakers. Now, uh, the average uh, of many people in the developed and developing will make uh, consumer choices, not based on warnings from governments, but based on their perception of how, uh, what standards are applied in terms of the manufacturing of products, uh, whether you know, uh, they are produced in socially and environmentally sustainable uh, ways. Um, so I think in a sense, the public uh, is alert to those issues, but we as policymakers, we as uh, 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 international uh, civil servants uh, need to continue the dialogue to ensure that we are able to advocate uh, for changes in policy, both at the national and at the uh, uh, international level or the transnational level to ensure that uh, the, we keep pace with uh, changing consumer demands and uh, the higher expectations that consumers have as it relates to uh, sustainability and in this context, sustainability of our ocean. So I'll end with this uh, and thank you again for the opportunity to share my thoughts uh, with you on this very important issue. Thank you very much. Um... Now you have one minute each, <laughs> and I, I now go to <laughs> Ambassador Dwarka Kadavadi, please. I will be brief. Just three elements. The first one mentioned by Stephen, institutional coherence, and I give one concrete example. Mauritius started a conference on maritime security, and the first year we found out there are 51 initiatives in the Indian Ocean, for the ocean, all at cross purposes with each other. Second year, we had reduced it to 31, but there was greater coherence in it. So I need to find a way of getting UNCTAD to work with the Indian Ocean Commission to do some more work there. And I think this coherence will lead to financing. It will lead to the kind of financing that we, do, we need. The second thing is to cut back, I think, on all unsustainable practices, starting with subsidies and starting with IUU. All of us are, are convinced about that one. And the third thing, which is not less important, and I want to put it again, is what I mentioned Yvon Bourgnon earlier, was the cleanliness. Every year, we throw 10 million tons of plastic in the oceans. A manta that he's trying to create with solar energy picks up only 10,000 tons. You need 400 mantas to pick up 30% of that waste yearly. If we don't keep our oceans clean, the rest really doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Michael, I went over you. <laughs> Your turn now. <laughs> I was hoping you were skipping me. Anyway, I'll be very quick. Um, uh, just, just quickly, one very big uh, question is the question of uh, our concept of development. We've come a long way um, and, and the SDGs are important, but I think coming out of the, the pandemic, pandemic, we need a really renewed commitment to uh, globalism, to, to a global concept of development, to interdependence, 
uh, and from this will 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 come the, the the understanding of what we need to do in terms of of of, uh, of financing. Um, again, big lessons we can learn from the pandemic. And if we don't understand the uh, potential and challenge of the ocean economy, we won't be able to understand the, 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 the challenge of development. Secondly, I've said it, I think the opportunity of Barbados means is, is one for us to recognize the specific vulnerability of the SIDS. No matter how difficult, I think that would be an, a very important outcome. And thirdly, something we haven't really discussed today, but it strikes me very much as I see our societies in Europe starting to come out of the pandemic and other societies not, and that's a whole other issue in terms of equity. One issue that really strikes me is that of sustainable tourism. We really and our public need to understand the, the, the issue of sustainable tourism because I think we're in danger of just going back to the old model on the first day after the pandemic. And that's an issue I think we need to do more work in. But thank you very much. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Amy Gonzalez now. <laughs> Yes, just two points, you know, technical solutions are there for, for the ocean. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have the science already. What we need is financing, innovative financing and resourcing for these initiatives, particularly to promote blue economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honey Bannon, please. Um, all I said that we will continue to focus on education and training to meet the challenges of having uh, uh, the, 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 the right quality of practitioners in all the fields that bring together the, the blue economy. And we will partner with those who are willing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think all our, our, our panelists were really able to to, to, to finish with really the strongest, most urgent messages. And I think this just uh, goes to show how these um, interventions are important, how, how these debates are fundamental for policymakers to inform the decisions uh, that, that we take. I'd like to very much thank all of them. And of course, the participants also that put some interesting questions. Some of them might be answered uh, in, in writing and of course, a very, very warm, warm, warm thanks to UNCTAD for organizing this event and for inviting us. Um, in closing, I'd like to invite all participants to stay tuned and engaged on the second UN Oceans Conference that is going to take place in 2022. As I've said, the, the, the conference is uh, co-convened by Portugal and Kenya and it will be of utmost importance in re reorienting uh, ocean action for SDG 14 implementation in a totally different world. And we very much hope that, the, I mean, we don't hope, it has to be more open and, and sustainable. I hope to see you in person in Lisbon next year. I wish you a very nice evening and a happy World Oceans Day celebration. Again, thank you very much for UNCTAD for, for organizing this. Thank you.